Pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Richard S. Hess to you. Um, I've come to know him at uh, professional meetings. Uh, he's a prolific scholar, um, dozens and dozens of articles that he's published, as well as editing several books and publishing several of his own books, uh, including uh, most recently, Israelite Religions, an Archaeological and Biblical Survey of the Evidence for Israelite Religious Belief and Practice. And yesterday's, his presentation yesterday dealt with uh, some of those topics. Today, Dr. Hess's uh, remarks are entitled Between the Desert and the Sea, Il Israel's Wilderness Journey. I think you'll enjoy this. Dr. Hess is a careful scholar and an enthusiastic presenter. So if you'd join me in welcoming him to uh, BYU, we'll hear from him now. Thank you, Dr. Pike, and thank you for the invitation to be here and to present today. Uh, what I thought I would try to do is, uh, uh, as this is uh, sort of a, a place of international studies, to, to, to look at a, a particular area in the world, the Sinai and the Negev, and to uh, perhaps look at it uh, both in terms of the biblical and ancient context from the perspective of, uh, perspective of what Israel would have encountered in going through this land and through this region, and then just also from the larger perspective as well of uh, topography, uh, geology, and uh, some idea of what this land is like. Um, so we'll start as soon as I, the computer works. There we go. Um, the Sinai is, is where we would start first coming out of Egypt. Uh, Israel encounters, first of all, what today is known as the Sinai Peninsula. I want to look a little bit at its physical environment. Uh, first, its habitation and terrain. The Sinai is not simply an empty desert. Uh, it is, in fact, inhabited. There is a good uh, portion, uh, and, and even in ancient times, a number of uh, forts and sites along the northern part of the Sinai. This region going from Egypt to Israel was known as the way of the Philistines in the Bible and is also known in Egyptian sources from the uh, 13th century B.C. and thereabouts uh, as having been lined with forts along the way for the Egyptian armies as they moved back and forth into what was then their New Kingdom Empire in southern Canaan to stay overnight and then move on to the next uh, another day's journey and then stay at the next fort. Uh, the biblical uh, witness tells us that uh, Israel was not to go this way, that they were in fact to choose another route, presumably because they would encounter so much opposition from uh, these forts and the armies of Egypt. And so uh, their direction was to be more towards the south, and we'll look at that in a minute. But the actual uh, area of the Sinai in the south is also inhabited and has been since ancient times by Bedouin. Uh, estimated 10 to 15,000 Bedouin at any one time over the years. The structures you see here are not houses or dwelling places, but are, in fact, uh, tombs. These tombs go back and uh, were in use for and uh, perhaps 5,000 years ago in the early Bronze Age. They were used once and then uh, rebuilt and used again, called Nawamis. You can see them there, and they look for all the world like houses. But again, in the desert, the Bedouin who lived there would live in tents and... Uh, be involved in moving around. Uh, there were uh, pilgrims and travelers, merchants and others who came through and uh, this rock surface is one of many that bears witness to inscriptions that are left there over the centuries uh, in different uh, scripts and writing. The, one of the more famous sites in the Sinai on the western coast is one that we, uh, in the Bible, don't read about Israel actually visiting on their, on their uh, journey out of uh, uh, Egypt. But in fact, uh, some Israelites, certainly the larger culture that Israel partook of, the West Semitic world, West Semite uh, slaves, did work here and mine this area. Sarabit al-Kadim is known as the uh, uh, turquoise mines, uh, where uh, we know that uh, it, was, it was controlled by Egypt but uh, various West Semitic groups did, in fact, uh, mine it uh, at different seasons, and then they would go back to their homes, uh, such as Israel may have lived in, uh, in the eastern delta. 
And uh, we know this because the graffiti there uh, it represents some of the earliest scripts of uh, the West Semitic language and alphabetic script that we have. And it's still under study and discussion, uh, the, the brief statements that are made. But Israel would have traveled on roads, not, of course, paved like they are today, but since the mountains don't move but stay in the same place, they would have uh, presumably gone uh, along similar routes that we can follow uh, today. And uh, you can see this sense of the landscape here as we ha I have a number of slides with this of a kind of lunar, almost lunar-like terrain, the granite rock that, uh, and formations that create more and more presence as you go uh, south uh, into the Sinai Peninsula. Um, the route of the Exodus itself is something that has been discussed. Uh, there's been northern, central, and southern routes proposed. I'm uh, not really going to deal with this very much here. We talked about the northern route seems unlikely. The central route is problematic because of you know, lack of uh, oases and other things. However, this, this, the, the southern route uh, basically going along or near the uh, western coast of the Sinai down to the traditional site of Jebel Musa, uh, Arabic for Mount Moses, uh, Mount of Moses, the, uh, the site of uh, traditional site of Mount Sinai. That site does have oases, and there have been a number of attempts to connect to various uh, stopping points that are listed, both in the Exodus uh, itinerary and again in Numbers 33, uh, with uh, sites along there, to to some degree of success. Uh, the actual location of uh, Mount Sinai has also been disputed. There are some, uh, both more popular are. Uh, sort of archaeologists as well as uh, some better known scholars in the field who have suggested Jebel al Laos or one of those, the mountains in northwestern Saudi Arabia as being uh, most likely a Mount Sinai. The, the, uh, this is not impossible, but again, it, it requires routes that don't very easily match the itinerary that's described in the Bible. More likely, I would still uh, think, is the southern Sinai, and if not, uh, Jebel Musa than one of the other mountains. This is uh, Jebel Allows. The problem with this region is uh, uh, Saudi security does not allow any kind of traveling in here, let alone excavation or examination of this area. Uh, but uh, Jebel Musa in the southern Sinai Peninsula is a place where you will find St. Catherine's Monastery erected uh, uh, during the reign of Justinian for uh, the purpose of maintaining a permanent presence there uh, of Christians. Now, that site actually has been identified as Mount Sinai since the 4th century AD when H Helena, the mother of Constantine, uh, who Christianized the Roman Empire, went there and th that's what they showed her, uh, looking for Mount Sinai, and they showed her this site. And indeed, if you visit Mount Sinai, it has the antiquity and in fact, the, the, you can go up the mountain quite easily because there are steps cut in it. Uh, and those are ancient steps uh, uh, along that mountain. In fact, uh, as you go halfway up, they have the traditional site of the Elijah Chapel, uh, where Elijah uh, went in 1 Kings 18, 19, and, and saw or encountered this, the still voice of God. And at the top is some beautiful views of this whole region. Um, these were taken at dusk and you get a sense of uh, uh, sort of the magnificence and splendor, uh, its its own unique way of this area. Well, there's not a lot that the Sinai, of course, reveals archaeologically about Moses or Israel. There's no signs there saying Moses slept here or anything. And instead, what you have is uh, some religious evidence, but we have to go farther afield. Uh, if we want to look, for example, at the question of Aaron's calf and the, the golden calf, you'll remember the text from Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods, who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. 
And he received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord, to Yahweh. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, this is a description of the famous incident of the golden calf. But do we know anything about this calf or its purpose or its reason or why the people wanted it at this time? And for that, we'll go north a little bit and leave the Sinai for a moment up to the city of Ashkelon, the first a major town north of Gaza uh, today in Israel, but also uh, in ancient times. Uh, it was a Philistine city, and is perhaps best known that way, but before it was Philistine, uh, it was Canaanite. And uh, it is a town, though you don't see much of the town here. This is the park, and this is where the ancient site is, where excavations have been going on since 1985 uh, uh, in the current round of excavations recovering this area. Uh, one of the one of the things that was found, and this dates back, MB means Middle Bronze II, which is the 18th century BC, roughly. Uh, and they found a large, basically, mound of earth all the way around the city, which is identified throughout, the, uh, throughout Canaan and Syria and Palestine at this time as a glossy, it's called. Uh, it, it isn't the wall, but rather on top of that, the city wall would be built. This was a kind of structure underneath, whether to prevent battering rams or to prevent sappers or for whatever purpose. It was put there, and this is the entrance to the ancient city of uh, Ashkelon. And there uh, at that entrance in a small side room was found this. This is the uh, silver calf from Ashkelon. Uh, again, dating from around the 18th, 17th century BC, but the closest uh, object in time and place that we have uh, in a West Semitic context to, to the gold calf of Aaron's, even though it's some centuries earlier. You'll see that the body is made of bronze, the head and feet and uh, legs are covered in silver. There are protrusions of below the feet for the purpose, presumably, of mounting the, the, the calf. And then there's a little pot behind with a hole carved in so the calf can go in and out and have a place to stay. And uh, the actual size of it is only about a few inches. So it doesn't seem like this was the main object of worship or veneration. Rather, it may be a model of a larger object that was there and would have been destroyed in whatever army came in and uh, leveled the city at that, at that point when it was there. But this sense of having... An, a, an image that represents a deity and, and a calf a calf image is often associated in the uh, material from the myths of Ugarit about Baal and Ale and Asherah and the other gods and goddesses uh, a calf is often associated with a kind of younger warrior god who would be Baal there but uh, often associated with that kind of fighting deity uh, that having that at the entrance to the city was a way of defining this city as being protected by this deity. And that, we presume, is what is here. There are a number of examples of that around Palestine uh, in this period, in the second millennium B.C. and on into the first millennium B.C., where a deity and some sort of shrine would be there at the gate and you would go in and pour a libation or in some way honor that figure, and that figure would represent the, the protection of the city. This, of course, corresponds or becomes uh, um, redefined in the, in, in the biblical text in Deuteronomy 6, where we read uh, that you shall take these words and place them upon the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. That's probably not the gates of the temple, but the gates of the city, where for Israel, instead of having an image, they were to have the words of the covenant. Uh, uh, placed upon the gate, the entrance to the, uh, to the city, uh, that it was to be the Lord God, Yahweh, who was their protector and defender. Um, well, where else do we find calves? We find them in the Bible. Uh, we find them, you may remember, when, the, uh, when Solomon died and the kingdom divided, Jeroboam takes over. Jeroboam I takes over the northern kingdom. And we read, the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and he said to the people, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. 
behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Interesting similar expression and language as Aaron used with regards to the God because the God is the figure who leads the people as a warrior um, and is now replacing or somehow syncretizing together with uh, the God of Israel, Yahweh. And here, of course, what Jeroboam wants, what he doesn't want is for the people to leave the northern kingdom and go down to Jerusalem in the south and worship at the temple. Instead, what he wants is for them to stay there and worship in the northern kingdom. And so he builds two sanctuaries. You may remember the text talks about this. They were built at Dan and Bethel. Dan was the border town in the north for Israel and Bethel the border town in the south. So here these sanctuaries wind up at the extremities of the kingdom. Uh, just as at Ashkelon they were at the entrance, the image was at the entrance to the town, so here they're at the entrance to the kingdom. And again, they, they define who uh, the god of this kingdom and also provide protection for any enemies that may try to come in. The one other reference in the Old Testament found, uh, whereas Jeroboam's around 931, 930 B.C., uh, Hosea is writing about 750 B.C. during the reign of uh, Jeroboam II, actually, uh, and prophesies and uh, makes this statement in chapter 13. Ephraim refers to the northern kingdom here, the northern kingdom of Israel. When Ephraim spoke, men trembled. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. Now, what that all means, there's been some allusions to some ancient myths of Baal and other things, but clearly there's a connection here with the worship of Baal. And now they sin more and make for themselves molten images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. Sacrifice to these, they say, men kiss calves. Here, silver and calves are connected like the silver calf image we have from a thousand years earlier at, uh, at Ashkelon. And uh, so we see both silver and gold are used to make these objects and images. And uh, they continue. It continues to be a, a subject or, or a, a, an object of affection, devotion, and even worship. Uh, into the 8th century at the very, towards the very end of the northern kingdom. Uh, but the point is that they represent a deity that's associated with Yahweh, perhaps identical to Yahweh, only uh, in violation of the second commandment, they make these images. And so what's going on with Aaron and Israel back then? I believe that the main purpose of the image was to focus and localize the presence of God either Yahweh or Baal or someone, we're not told, uh, who would be given the credit of leading the people out of Egypt. Moses had gone up to the mountain, the text tells us, Mount Sinai, and was, worship, uh, was communing with God up there and receiving the law. And the people, just two chapters earlier, or not two, a number of chapters earlier, but rather shortly before they arrived at Sinai and in Exodus 17, had found themselves fighting the Amalekites, a Bedouin group that had, been, that had threatened them and threatened their very existence. You remember the story there where Moses holds up his hands and the people win the battle. But the point is that they felt threatened. They felt threatened by enemies, and here they were on a plain quite vulnerable uh, in the Sinai Peninsula, an area they didn't know about or didn't know the, uh, the, how they might be attacked or threatened or anything else. And so they build this image, they have Aaron build it, as a means of bringing God present there and localizing him and protecting them as their protector, just as at Ashkelon, at Dan and Bethel, and on uh, even witnessed in Hosea. So this, is, uh, this would be my understanding of the primary purpose of the building of that calf. And, the, and from looking around the area, we see and understand a little bit more of this calf imagery. Well, Israel goes on and it leaves the Sinai, uh, Deuteronomy 1 tells us it's about 11 days' march from Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, uh, modern Ein el Kuderat. This is the region. It's still rather in the desert. In fact, today it's still in, in the Egyptian-controlled area of the Sinai in the northeastern part. Uh, the excavations there have not revealed any finds from the period of ancient uh, Israel's passing through this region, but they didn't stay there very long, and you wouldn't expect to, there to be a lot of uh, remnants from there. Rather, I want to spend most of our time or the rest of our time here looking at the Negev, which is where, according to the biblical text, Israel spends, what, about 
38 years, 40 years uh, of its wandering where that whole generation dies. You'll remember it's from Kadesh Barnea that they attempt to go into the promised land, or they refuse to go into the promised land after sending the spies and accepting the majority report of 10 of the 12 spies that they can't go in. And then uh, God says, all right, well, the whole generation will die in the wilderness. The following day they decide, well, maybe we can go in. And so they do, and they're beaten back. It's too late, and so uh, that generation is condemned to wander about. Whether it's like these arrows show or not, I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced. But um, I want to look a little bit at uh, the Negev uh, and talk, uh, as we have, about the biblical evidence about the habitation here. Uh, what would Israel have seen or encountered in wandering through this area? and understand a little of the commerce and resources and then some of the religious evidence, the standing stones and some of the other things here we'll, uh, we'll try to look at. But it's a remarkable area. The biblical Negev, the, the Negev that's described in the Bible where Abraham and some of the patriarchs live and their families is actually a small region here in this area around Arad and Beersheba. That, that valley through that region uh, from the north, uh, southeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea over to the southern tip of the Dead Sea or that region. The modern Israeli Negev, which is occupied by Israel, includes that region but more. It then extends in a line down the Arabah, what is a depression that continues the depression of the Salt Sea, all the way down to a lot at the northern tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. I'll show that uh, minute or two, and then it extends in a, tri uh, in a diagonal, completing the triangle, uh, dividing Sinai and the Negev up to the southeastern corner of the Mediterranean, roughly. So uh, with that in mind, you can perhaps see it a little bit more clearly here. This is the biblical Negev in relation to the Sinai. I think the Sinai is drawn a little bit smaller here than it actually is and the Negev is bigger, but that's okay, uh, that, that triangle. Now, uh, geologically, uh, this, well, this depression uh, that forms here sits at the meeting place of two geological plates. Tectonically, it starts as a valley uh, rift uh, up uh, in Turkey and in Asia and comes down through the Lebanese Baca the Hula Basin uh, north of the Sea of Galilee, through the Sea of Galilee, through the Jordan Valley, through the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on earth, and down through this Arabah, as it's called, the depression right down here. And this is the Gulf of Aqaba. It continues on down the Gulf of Aqaba and goes right into Africa. So that, that is a major uh, geological fault. And indeed, you, if you go north today in Israel, uh, east and north of the Sea of Galilee, you'll see dormant volcanoes. Uh, uh, this was uh, uh, geologically active, uh, volcanic active uh, area in ancient times. And the, up there particularly, you see the black basalt rock, which is used to, uh, con for construction purposes and everything. But uh, let's move on and uh, consider that this area was inhabited more so in ancient times than modern times uh, uh, up to the present. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a dwelling site. You can see, I think there's a person over here walking, get an idea of the size. But this would have been a small village of a few remnants of sites from uh, between 3000 and 2000 BC. And a corral here with uh, evidence that animals were kept inside of it. And they would have uh, lived here and then moved to another spot uh, half the year. They would have moved uh, every half the year. Uh, and as the sort of seasons change from the dry to the wet season, moving from one place to another for the flocks and herds. Um, there was a severe drying in this area that took place around 2400 BC, and after that, uh, the area became much more of a desert uh, like it is today. But it continued to be inhabited. From the time of Christ, From you have these Nabataean structures. This is a uh, either a storage facility, some say a meeting Hall from the, the time the Nabataeans occupied this area uh, and uh, as a people. And they uh, <coughs> built this structure uh, thousands of years later. Uh, there is evidence, uh, if you look closely here, perhaps some of you can see it. Uh, the whole desert here is very rocky, but you'll see places that were cleared away and uh, 
possibly this is evidence that uh, there was tents there at some point in the re presumably recent past. The Bedouin today have the more rectangular tents, but uh, that's only been true for several hundred years. If you go back before that, they actually had more circular tents and used them. Well, uh, going back and, and looking at this, uh, we see that there is habitation in ancient times, and Israel would have encountered people here, uh, as they did. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more about this region in terms of its uh, commercial uh, uh, location as a strategic location. It sits at the, very, at the very northern end of the Gulf of Aqaba. This is the Gulf of Aqaba where it goes down along the Sinai and out into the Red Sea, down along the western border of Saudi Arabia. And of course, this is the area from which, for example, the Queen of Sheba would have come. From Saba, modern day Yemen at the southern tip of Saudi Arabia, that's where they had the spices, the myrrh and frankincense there, and immediately west of that, uh, almost connecting with the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, Somalia, Eritrea, that region. And uh, that would have been, of course, of great interest. They would have brought the spices up by, presumably by boat to the Gulf of Aqaba and then taken the journey up to Jerusalem. In the case of the Queen of Sheba, other merchants, no doubt, made it up to the Mediterranean Sea, over to the Egypt and and through the Mediterranean with that trade. And beyond that today, of course, it, it has strategic interest because this is a major port for Israel and for Jordan reaching out into the Indian Ocean and the in, entire southern uh, hemisphere there, east of Africa and uh, southern Asia. Well, this is looking north along that region, along the uh, eastern border of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, this is, by the way, Tava, fam made famous by some recent... Uh, every several years, the Palestinian and Israelis have negotiations there. It's just at the border with Egypt, uh, and on the other side, uh, Israel begins. And if you go north up to uh, Eilat and Aqaba, you can see here maybe just a little bit, uh, it's not a very good slide, of some of the tankers, uh, oil and other uh, important resources that are uh, brought there. But... Um, this slide, which is an old slide, uh, decades old now, shows better. Uh, the part closer is the Israeli city or town of a, of a lot. The part farther away, to the actually to the east, is the Jordanian town of Aqaba, and it's actually an international border that goes in between them, uh, between Jordan and uh, and Israel. And this sits at the southern tip of this Arava depression and. Here then begins the Gulf of Aqaba. So it's a very strategic site and uh, one that neither Israel or Jordan would give up because of its importance to, to them for trade and uh, other purposes. Now if you go about 10, 20 miles north of that, uh, of a lot, we come to Timna Valley. Timna Valley is one example of a couple of, 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 a couple of valleys that are found both west of the Araba and east of it. In modern Jordan, here we're in Israel. Uh, which is rich in natural resources. The reddish hue, ooh, uh, and yeah, I just bring the map back to show you it's, it's right up in this area here that we are. Uh, and an aerial or a satellite photography map. This is a lot. This is the Arava going north, and uh, then uh, these are the valleys off to the side and the Timna Valley in there. Uh, that we're looking at. But the reddish shoes betray the iron oxidation that exists all around this region. Uh, uh, these are very mineral rich uh, mountains and uh, this valley is uh, very rich in that. It, it in ancient times was used as a source for copper before uh, iron was, there, there was interest in iron. And indeed in the valley you find these saucer-like uh, depressions filled in now but these are there may be, uh, someone has estimated 10,000 of them. These are depressions that would have been used for mining. They would have, uh, in other words, these are holes left over. They, they, they dug holes down and then connected them at the bottom for some air and uh, mined the copper. That's, uh, that's how it was done. And the people who would have occupied this, this area, uh, we don't know their identity, but it's in the same area that uh, we would find the Midianites. Uh, with uh, the time, uh, by the time of Israel passing through this region and Moses' uh, uh, in-laws and that sort of thing. Here's a mine shaft that was opened, uh, another one accidentally opened on the side. 
Uh, and there are remnants of refineries here uh, that uh, can be somewhat reconstructed, not much to see, as well as uh, slag heaps where the impurities were removed from the, uh, from the copper. And, of course, it would then be joined with tin and uh, create bronze, a harder substance, which remained a, an important metal and a harder, sh uh, stronger metal even in through the early Iron Age. Uh, iron was, even when iron was known, it still did not have the strength until later processes enabled it to, uh, to obtain them. This is another satellite view of this Arava. We're now going farther north, and this is up to the Dead Sea here, and uh, the depression as it continues south of the Dead Sea. Um, I want to move now to focus in on what Israel would have encountered in terms of religion, religious evidence, which is of uh, greatest interest to me. The religious evidence of this region uh, is found in several forms. One is dozens of these sites. These are, in the Bible, they're called matzevot, singular matzeva, which is the word for standing stone simply. And as you can see, here they, here's a group of them. They, are made, they often appear in groups of seven or nine or twelve. Uh, the, the, they have in front of them, that they just aren't accidental stones, uh, they, they have in front of them often a, an area to receive libations. And carbon-14 dating, these libations date it back seven, nine thousand years before the present in some cases. So these go back as far as you want to go well before Israel anyway. Uh, and you get often alternation between thinner ones and fatter ones, and different people have done different studies on this and compared them. Uh, the, uh, the idea that they represent deities uh, and that they represent and would be honored or worshipped or venerated deities or something like that is very possible. Indeed, up to the 20th century, there are evidence of Bedouin doing that kind of venerating, pouring out uh, before these stones. Some have suggested they can identify some of the fatter ones as female deities and the thinner ones as male deities, but I don't know. Uh, they sometimes appear in circles like this as well, and there are dozens of these. Of course, you have standing stones in the Bible, but they aren't used for, uh, for purposes of worship. They're used as memorials where God is encountered. Jacob sets up a stone at Bethel when he encounters God there. Moses sets up stones at Mount Sinai when he encounters God there. Uh, and, and representing the tribes of Israel. Joshua, when they cross the Jordan River, sets up 12 stones to c commemorate God's work there of separating the Jordan River and the 12 tribes. And then later on in Joshua 8, 30 to 35, in Joshua 24, he sets up stones, a stone at Mount Ebal to commemorate uh, the treaty and covenant renewal that takes place there with God. So... These sorts of things were used for other purposes, but uh, certainly one of them, in the broader perspective, would have been for the purpose of veneration and worship. Uh, it may be that the best known standing stone uh, out of the Middle East, ancient Middle East, uh, modern Middle East, ancient Middle East, ancient Near East, it was in fact the, uh, is in fact the Kaaba at Mecca, which is effectively a standing stone, perhaps uh, Muhammad, was unable to know what to do with it, uh, in, a, in effect, because it was so powerful of a religious symbol that he couldn't overthrow it like he did some of the other things, so he made it the center of the Hajj. And, and of course, there are all kinds of legends surrounding it that Hagar and Ishmael came there, and, and uh, that's where they, uh, uh, the angel appeared to them and promised them the future that would come. But in any case, uh, they remained significant, and Israel would have encountered these. Another thing they would have encountered, there are a dozen or more of these. These are, uh, and you can see the early dating on this in Carbon 14, these are uh, uh, open-air sanctuaries. They're simply what you see there, not, no walls or anything else. They're marked off by double or triple row of stones all the way around. The corners follow the points of the compass, and over in the one side is a... <coughs> sort of cell or shell of cell over to, and there's some standing stones in there and maybe places for offerings, a special holy spot, and then the rest of this would be somehow sacred. This idea of sacred space in the Negev is well known in Israel uh, at Mount Sinai. They, you remember, they set a barrier around the mountains. Nobody can cross that. If they do, they will die, animal or human. And then later on, of course, with the tabernacle itself, there is a special border around it 
coming into the courtyard of the tabernacle where only certain people can come and then beyond that into the actual tabernacle itself. So sacred space was known to Israel but it also shares that with the surrounding culture through which it passes. These are rock cut crenellations, that is they're piles of rock. Uh, they're artificially constructed piles of rock. They're ancient billboards. They're used to mark uh, uh, perhaps special tombs of revered uh, individuals or uh, standing stones or some other such feature. And then finally, I want to look at the Hathor Temple. The Hathor Temple is, uh, is so-called, this takes us back to the Timna Valley where the copper was mined, where they were doing that. And what we see here, this was uh, excavated by uh, Benno Rottenberg back in the late 60s. The uh, structure around it, of course, is reconstructed, this wall. But it's basically an op uh, an, a sanctuary, and this is the, uh, they call it a Temenos wall. It marks off the sacred space, just like we saw with the open air sanctuaries. It marks off the sacred space. And in the middle we have uh, an entrance, and then we have a flat uh, paved area, and then we have this area, which presumably would have held an altar or something for offerings up against the rock cliff here. And uh, in fact, if I show you these slides here, you may see this is looking at that altar area, the paved area in front, and you can see a channel coming out for, for the blood of the sacrifices to carry it away, and perhaps also water as well to wash it away that would have been used. There are various vessels, some standing stones, but more, uh, more sort of vessels for, for holding those liquids and perhaps the sacrifices uh, around it. Uh, the site itself was uh, built and used in the 13th and 12th centuries BC, and it may well reflect a, uh, a particular Midianite shrine or something like that, we don't have the identity of the people who were there, but again, this area would uh, have been occupied by uh, people, at least the Bible identifies as, as Midianite. But uh, what's perhaps more interesting about it is that Rottenberg, when he excavated this, discovered large quantities of blue and yellow cloth and concluded, and it's been generally followed, that this site was covered over, it was, it was covered over by a tent cloth tent, uh, and is in fact a tent shrine that was used for, for whatever god the people there worshipped. Now that, of course, uh, brings to mind immediately the tabernacle. In fact, this is the only tent shrine we have in this region, uh, other than the tabernacle described in the Bible, and, uh, they, and again, it's from the 13th century BC, right around the time of Israel's passing through this area, and uh, on into the 12th century BC, let me show you um, the cliff above it, uh, and it's hard to see now after 3,300 years, it tends to wear away, but the, there's an image of the Egyptian deity Hathor uh, and uh, some uh, hieroglyphs making that identification. There is an Egyptian papyrus from the 12th century BC that identifies a site called Attica where copper was mined, and that may in fact be here. So what they did was the Egyptians would have taken over whatever was the Midianite or whatever group was here their sanctuary, and syncretized their god, in this case Hathor, uh, with uh, the god that was there, and then uh, created a worship center of that sort for the people, the miners, and the others who were in that region. Uh, this is the, the, the best example of a site from this period. Now, what's also interesting is they found a bronze serpent here. And, of course, the bronze serpent brings to mind the uh, story of Numbers 21, uh, verses 5 through 9, the last of the uh, trials or rebellions of Israel before they, they cross over into the area while well, they first come to Edom, but then they can't go to Edom, so they have to go around Edom and then up and fighting Sihon and uh, Og. But uh, here they are in the Negev, and the people spoke against Moses in Numbers 21, and, uh, uh, against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, for there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food? Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. 
Of course, the bronze serpent here is understood to represent the rebellion of the people and their complaints, which then and the judgment of God in the form of a serpent. And by looking at that, by acting in faith and looking at it, they, uh, they come to life. This is the basis of, behind, of course, the famous text in John 3, where Jesus says, even as, um, the, uh, just as, a serp- as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That theme of uh, Jesus taking on the very uh, judgment of God and the sin of the world and the people looking to him. So this, uh, this has uh, lasting implications. Now, this bronze serpent, of course, is not the one that Israel had because Israel took, according to, the, according to the book of Kings, they took it with them into the promised land and it became an object of worship. So by the time of Hezekiah, around 700 B.C., he actually destroyed the bronze serpent, which had then come to be known as the Nehushtan there, and uh, eliminated it. But it's interesting that the one bronze serpent object that we actually have uh, dates from this time as well. And there it is at, uh, at the Hathor Shrine in, uh, in uh, the Negev. So in terms of a summary, what we could say is that Israel did not need to wait until it entered the promised land in order to encounter a religious environment. It already had encountered that religious environment. We aren't told a lot about this in the Pentateuch, but certainly later texts, especially in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, do reflect a memory, and some of the Psalms, of Israel being enticed to worship uh, the Shadu and other things if they're understood as goat demons or however they're translated. Uh, So certainly there were things going on with Israel, in addition to the selected rebellions that are mentioned there in Numbers. Uh, also, the use of uncut stones. I didn't uh, spend a lot of time with this, but with the matzevot, everything you saw, none of the stones were worked. And we talked more about this yesterday, but you will remember that in the altar law, in Exodus 20, 22 through 28 or 9, and especially at verse 25, it says, when you build an altar, this is the very first law that God gives after the Ten Commandments about building an altar to worship him. Don't, he says, don't make any images to worship me, but he says, build an altar of uncut stones and use that to worship me. And uh, the same way with uh, the later uh, constructions, they were not to cut the stones. And even with the temple, which was designed on a different model, the cutting of the stones was to take place away from the site of the temple itself. So the use of uncut stones is found not in Canaan. Canaan, they cut their stones everywhere and made very nice, smooth surfaces but rather altars and other objects of uncut stones would come right out of the desert, the Negev, and uh, this region. The use of sacred space, as we talked about, at uh, Mount Sinai, in the tabernacle, in the temple, the idea of special space marked off as holy to God, and not just anyone could go through it at any time. Indeed, right up into the New Testament times with the temple, certain courts, and uh, marking them up. Erected stones of special significance, we see, as we mentioned, with Joshua at Bethel, with Moses at Sinai, with, uh, excuse me, with Jacob at Bethel, Moses at Sinai, and Joshua at Gilgal. The tent sanctuary the, and the tabernacle itself as a tent sanctuary, where did they get that? Well, certainly the one actual object we have is uh, found and only found in the Negev at this time. And overall, this sense that it's not that Israel simply went through and borrowed all the uh, religious elements uh, that were there, but rather took what was there and transformed it. In fact, one can argue, uh, looking at the sacrificial system and many of the other cults, that it wasn't that they, they, that they they simply borrowed it, but they simplified it. Indeed, the sacrifices and, and much of what they did was a simplification in comparison with the cultures around them to emphasize the relationship with God over and above the particularities of, uh, of the cultic uh, routine and ritual. And finally, the influence of the desert on the cultivated land. We often don't think of this, but Moses spent 40 years in the desert before he, uh, before he led the people. And the people themselves spent 40 years in the desert before, as a nation, they came into the promised land. And, of course, Elijah goes into the desert after the struggles and uh, discouragement of his encounters with Baal at, uh, at uh, Mount Carmel uh, and Ahab and Jezebel. And uh, he, into the New Testament, John the Baptist, where, uh, his beginning, initiating ministry, 
uh, for Jesus is in the desert at the Jordan River. Jesus himself goes into the desert for 40 days uh, in preparation for his ministry and for the temptation with the devil. And uh, on into the early church, uh, we have monasteries with the beginning of, mastic- of monasticism in Egypt uh, in the desert. So it's, a, it's an ongoing reality, a kind of retreat, a place to get away in preparation then to go into the world and whatever it may, uh, one may encounter there. And that uh, brings us to the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Some of you probably have to go to a class, but if you'd like to stick around, stay around and ask Dr. Hess some questions, uh, he'd be happy to answer your questions. Just try to speak up as best you can. Can I bring you the mic? Can bring the mic? Oh, the blue cloth that you mentioned in the, from the tent. What kind of cloth was that? Yes, and I'm not sure that uh, I've ever read what kind it was, so I can't answer you for certain. If I were to guess, I would say wool because of the sheep in, in that area and things like that. That would be the most common fabric. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Um, I know the time difference is very great, but... Did you work together at all with the people that did the research on Lehi's exodus from Jerusalem? Because the the regional there are regional similarities. Uh, no, I didn't. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the Matzavot go back to the Chalcolithic period. Uh, and earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah Neolithic um, uh, I'm just curious if you remember at all if the, uh, the one, if all of them are undressed or just the ones in, uh, in the Israelite areas. All the one, um, I spent some time, visited several dozen sites in the Negev with, uh, at that time I was, Uzi Avner and some other archaeologists. He's a district archaeology for the Neg- an archaeologist for the Negev. He said that there were other similar undressed stones in uncut stones in uh, the Sinai as well, but not as many. And over into the uh, Arabian Arabian Peninsula, all of those that we saw were uh, uncut. Um, of course, if you go up, for example, the uh, the stones at Hatzor, at the high place there, are clearly uh, some of those are cut, and some of those have images cut into them, the, the half-moon uh, formation and, and at uh, Gesher as well. Uh, they're, they're just a number that you, you see it much more in the settled areas where, they, where there is an artificial, that is, a man-made uh, uh, pre- uh, uh, addition to the stones, if you want to call that, cutting of the stones. That, but you don't see it at all in the Negev. I never saw it. Um, Would you comment then on uh, why the restriction to only use uncut stones for altars and then why more settled regions tend to have, is it just we're more capable, we can, we're fancier, we're civilized, or do you think there's some other conceptual or thematic influences at play there? Yeah, and of course we're never told, so I don't, we don't know for sure why uncut stones were used. One, uh, a, one traditional uh, way of looking at it was to say, well, Israel is here different from the Canaanites. And it's true, they are, but 
they're like the people in the Negev in, in, in doing this in one sense. Although in the Negev, we don't have the example of altars, for example. Only in Israel do we have the, 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 those kinds of altars where we clearly have example. Even at the Hathor sanctuary, the place for the altar, but we don't actually see what was used. Um, the other thing would be that the uncut stone represents perhaps something anthropological. It's closer to nature. It's not, uh, it's not in any way worked by human hands. So the, some, the idea being that it, it, it places more of what is done under the direct control of God and not under some kind of uh, human artifice of some sort. Uh, that's a, but again, that's just a speculation. Can you take a question on something else? Yes. Uh, well, if I, I guess. I don't know if I can answer it. But I... What do you make of uh, Ezekiel's statement that your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite? Um, well, yeah, that, that I guess goes all the way back, isn't it, to the confession in Deuteronomy 27. And uh, you have there this sense that uh, uh, my father was a wandering Aramean there. So you've got... Uh, Arameans and Amorites and Hittites. So, well, um, my understanding of the use of the term Amorite and Hittite there is similar to the use, well, the, the use of the term Amorite, uh, there are, are several different usages of that term, but in that context, I would understand it to be connected with uh, the early Amorites, the Mar II people that are mentioned, that are uh, found at Mari in the 18th century uh, and at the whole region. Basically, it means the West, and it reflects this idea of West Semitic people. And I think uh, so, so that the, the idea that Israel comes, has as its origins, going all the way back to Abram in that land and that region. And indeed, uh, I have uh, in my uh, book on personal names in Genesis 1 to 11, I argue that the, uh, that the, Genealogy, the second half of the genealogy from Shem down to Abram in Genesis 11 is really, many of those names, Terah, Nahor, Haran, can be identified with place names in the Balik Valley and elsewhere right around that area in northern Syria, southern Turkey today. And that would be the heart kind of, of uh, the heartland of Amorite uh, uh, peoples from that time. So. I would see a connection going back to, to those people and that era, era as far as that term and the way it's used there, ultimately a tradition to that. As far as the Hittite term, the Hittite, uh, of course, the Hittite empire is, is, is well known as being based in Turkey and uh, the Hittites themselves, although they, they kind of import the Indo-European language, they have a more native language than Nes Neshite and other languages connections there uh, before that language comes in. But, but I, I, I don't think it is that. I think it's similar to the use of the Hittite term, the Hittite country, in Joshua 1, where he describes the boundaries, and he describes sort of northern Canaan, the boundaries of Canaan, northern Canaan, as the land of the Hittite uh, territory or country. And this, I think, is in fact a term that's used post-Hittite empire especially, to refer to that whole region. Indeed, the Egyptians throughout, before and after the Hittite empire, referred to that land as Hatti land, northern Syria. And I think it's, it's, it's therefore talking about a similar region and a similar area. Um, also, uh, well then of course the Arameans would also be associated with that region. So I think all three of these terms are designed to uh, reflect the, the fact that the people who are known as Israel, descended from Abram, are in fact immigrants coming from a foreign land. And they are coming, and all that means with regards to following God faithfully, hearing his call, responding to it, and coming into the land, uh, I think is, uh, is, is really what's being said. So, I take on it.